Genesis chapter 3, take your Bible, turn there, it's good to be here this afternoon. We're getting, days are getting shorter. And they will continue to do that in the month of December until about the 21st or 22nd. And uh, I ought to teach that again sometime about the, the rising and setting of the sun from south to north to south again. It's a beautiful picture. Sun rises east to west every day, but it rises from the south to the north and then to the south again. It, it does it every year. And uh, we don't think of it that way, but that's why we have shorter days in the wintertime, longer days in the summertime, because the, the movement of the sun relative to the earth, and, uh, it's, and God designed it. I know that Satanists and pagans and New Agers and Wiccans celebrate the solstices and the equinoxes, uh, but God is the one who designed the movement of every star, the earth, the sun, God is the one who designed that. It's his design. To me, it doesn't show forth anything about any pagan God. It shows Jesus is the sun. He is the light of the world. And it shows his resurrection, shows his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection again. It's what it shows to me. Because he is the light of the world. So I don't worship some pagan God. I worship the real God. Amen. But that's what's happening in December. Our days are getting shorter and they're going to keep getting shorter. It's going to get dark real quick. All right. Genesis chapter 3. Eve in verse 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food. The devil's done put the idea he's already infested and infected her mind with his poison. He poisoned her, but not with the venom of a serpent. He poisoned her with the venom of his words. That's what he did. So now she's got this temptation in her mind to look at that tree in a different way. Her consciousness has been altered. Her awareness has been changed. And I submit to you today, I absolutely 100% believe that everything that's going on in this world, in technology, genetics, the occult, everything is to bring all of mankind to a new awareness, a new consciousness. And it's to follow the man of sin is what it's, it's setting up to, to, to be done. Just like Eve now has her eyes. She's looking at this tree in a different way now than she did prior to Satan coming to her and putting those words in her mind. Now she's looking before, before Satan, Adam said, God has told me that we cannot eat the fruit of that tree. So Eve doesn't pay much attention to it. But now that Satan has said what he said, he's the deceiver. He's the tempter. He is the one that draws us away, blinds our eyes, draws us to lust, to covet, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. That's all what that tree represents. Now, And that's what he does with everyone. He's done it with me. He's done it with you. He's done it with everybody. There's none righteous. No, not one. We're, we're born in sin because we're children of Adam and Eve. So the woman saw the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes. And the tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat. Gave also unto her husband and with her and he did eat. Now both of them. Boom. They are now sinners. Only one commandment. Only one sin, they committed it. And look what happened, verse 7. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew they were naked. They knew it. They, there, was, there was a change in how they saw themselves. Immediately, they sought to cover themselves up. They heard, uh, they... Uh, they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. They're covering their organs. 
They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Isn't that, isn't that neat? This is, of course, is Jesus pre-incarnate. And Jesus, before he's born in Bethlehem, anytime you see God in the Old Testament, you're, I think for the most part, you're looking at Christ. But here's God walking with Adam and Eve. God speaking to Adam, talking to him. But now it's different. Because they heard, verse 8, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Look at verse 9. And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, where art thou? Now I want you to think about this. God knows everything, everybody, and their exact location better than the NSA and Google does. God knew that they were hiding behind the trees. But he asked the question, where art thou? Because now they're lost. At this point, Adam and Eve are lost people. And now they need a savior or they will die. They need a savior. Where art thou to me? Has I've, I've had this thought in my mind for years. Where art thou? They are lost separated from God, cannot be in the presence of God. They are, it's a wall of partition built there. And he said, here's Adam, he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And I want you to look at what sin has done to this man. Here's this man who has the sharpest mind in the world. He has the ability, God gave him the ability to name every animal in the earth. Every one of them. So he does that. He has already enjoyed the blessing of his wife. And he is walking pure in God's sight. But now sin has brought fear. Let me tell you about, let's pray, and I'll tell you about a man I know. Father, we ask your blessings on your word tonight. Open our eyes, help us to understand and to see things the way they really are. And uh, remove the blindness that the devil has put on our eyes. And uh, help us to understand your word. Give us, give us understanding, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. It's a man that he works for Google, and his name is Ray Kurzweil. And he has decided that he does not want to die. So he's, uh, he's a multimillionaire several times. He's an inventor. He's a very, very smart, intellectual man. And... He had a very close relationship with his father and his mother, and they both died, and that relationship really affected him deeply, and he does not want to die. So he has formed a, a group that is investigating death and what causes it so that we can extend our life infinitely. That's what he's doing. He's spending all the dollars that he personally has accumulated. He's got investors investing. He's, he works for Google now. As, and Google is in on this. They want to find a way by using technology or by altering genetics. I saw what you sent me. By altering genetics, curing diseases. But Ray Kurzweil is the one that Time Magazine wrote an article about him, featured on the cover, what was it, the year 2046? 2040? 
something like that. So, I think it's 2045 or something like that. But, but the year that man becomes immortal. He has made several predictions and he's been very close in his predictions. But he's predicting that by the, by the mid-40s, we will cheat death and be able to live into infinity, eternity. He's afraid. He's afraid of dying. And I'll tell you why. He says that he doesn't believe in God. But I think the inner man in him, his soul, knows that there is a God. And he knows he's going to stand before that God and give an account of everything he's done in his life that's wrong. I mean, he seems like a, a normal average guy. I don't know what his sins are, but I guarantee you he's got them. He's a, he's a person. People are sinners. Every one of us. There's none righteous, no, not one. So down deep in his heart, I believe that he is wanting to cheat death because he is like Adam. I was afraid. Sin always brings fear. And people try to cover that fear up with more sin. More alcohol, more drugs, more sex, more what, whatever, more lies, more power, whatever, more domination. Whatever their thing is, they try to cover that fear up with more sin. And that adds more fear to it. So Adam now, for the first time in his life, there's a, there's a nerve that comes out of your brain that goes down from your brain right to your stomach and your intestines. What's it called? The vagus nerve. V-A-G-U-S, I believe. And it triggers emotional responses in our bowels. When you get fearful, all of a sudden you get sick to your stomach or your bowels start rolling and some people actually mess themselves in fear because of that nerve. Okay? God designed it that way. Sin will make you afraid. Afraid to face God, afraid to face reality, afraid to face your own sin. The greatest thing God will ever do with you is confront you face to face about your own sin. It's the greatest thing God's ever done for me, the greatest thing he's ever done for you guys is to confront you personally about your sin. And God is having a confrontation here with Adam. It's not an accident that God has just happened to be walking in that garden at that exact time. He knew what was going on. Okay? He was afraid. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. So verse 11, God said, he said, who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Now, does God already know the answer to that question? Mom... You've asked me questions. Mike, did you do that knowing that I did it? Why did you ask me that question? See if I was going to lie about it. Give me a choice. Did you do this? Okay. She already knew I did. So I'm trying to think of a lie. Cops can read people like books when they pull them over 12 o'clock midnight five people in a car they don't know where they came from they don't know where they're going all of a sudden they're just driving around and the cop is reading they can see the guy's pulse right here boom 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 because he's afraid he knows he's got drugs in, in the car and he's fixing to get caught. And he's got to come up with a lie. God and the cop knows it. Cop knows it. 
One of my favorite guys on Live PD is Danny Brown out in South Carolina. He can smell marijuana a mile away. There's marijuana. He, can, he can drive past a car and go, there's marijuana in that car. Turn around and wait for them to do something, some traffic infraction to pull him over. And, he say, and he'll say, come on, I already know you got pot in the car. Where is it? Don't lie to me. But that's what God did. God's, God already knew the answer to the question. He was wanting Adam to admit it. And let me tell you something. Confession is good for the soul. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I believe in confessing our sins to God. So, the man said in verse 12, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. So he did tell the truth. He owned up to it. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me and I did eat. She told the truth. She didn't say, I didn't eat that tree. She didn't try to pin it on Adam. She told the truth. I'm telling you, the truth will make you free. It'll make you free. You know, I told the story this morning, getting pulled over, 65 and a 35. And when that judge asked me, how do you plead, guilty or not guilty? I said, I'm guilty. I'm not going to argue. I'm not going to fight it. I know what I was doing. I was doing wrong. And that judge had mercy on me. He didn't have to, but he had mercy on me. And God had mercy on Adam and Eve. So, verse 14, the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field upon thy belly. So, we get this idea that Satan was a dragon, a serpent, and he had legs prior to this, but then God has taken them off. So now, and, and we do, still do have reptiles that have legs, obviously. We call them lizards. The Bible term for them is dragons. Um, but we also have reptiles that do not have legs. They are the, and think of opposites. God is the most high, and of all the beasts of the earth, the serpent is the most low. Because you can't, even ants walk on legs and are elevated above the ground by a slight millimeter. Cockroaches, mice, other types of small creatures, they walk on legs, but they're still higher than the serpents. The serpents are the most low of all the beasts. God cursed him that way. Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And that is absolutely, absolutely 100% True, because even though a snake serpent has a nose, he does not use that nose for sniffing out odors in the air. He uses his tongue. His tongue comes out and it picks up minute particles that are floating around in the air, dust. And when his tongue detects an animal dead or alive, that tells him there's food there, go to it. He is smelling with his tongue. And Moses, I'm here to tell you, Moses wrote the book of Genesis and there's no way in the world that Moses knew that serpents smelled with their tongue. Moses did not know that. So this was not the invention of some primitive a uh, tent dweller in the middle of the desert making up stories and myths and fables because man did not have the knowledge that why the serpent's tongue kept coming out all the time and lizards do the same thing 
is that's they're literally eating the dust that's in the air that comes from this earth. They're eating that. It's going into their mouth and they're tasting it to see what is in the neighborhood. Moses didn't know that, but God did because God designed them and, and Moses wrote it down. Verse 15 is the most, I think, the most crucial part of this. I will put enmity, that means warfare, strife, constant strife. I will put enmity between thee, the serpent, and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And it shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel. Her seed, eventually, we follow the lineage you can go to Luke chapter 3, and you can see the lineage that goes backwards from Christ all the way down through David, through Abraham, to Adam. So Jesus was the son of Adam and Eve, the offspring. And the seed of the woman is at warfare with the seed of the serpent. And guess who the seed of the serpent is? Anti-Christ. The opposite of Jesus Christ. And it's literal. I absolutely believe it's literal. Now, especially in the day where we are, I'm saying we, mankind is literally rewriting all the DNA that they can get their hands on to rewrite. Ron, it's like giving a loaded, cocked, Automatic weapon to a three-year-old child. He's going to shoot and kill everything inside. And man now has the ability to rewrite all the DNA that he wants to. And he's playing God and he's not God. He's not good at it. But anyway, I believe in the literal interpretation of that. Now, verse 16, he says, unto the woman... I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. And we're going to talk about that. So this is why in childbearing, the woman has a really hard time. I was there with my wife for the delivery of all of our children. And I went, oh my goodness, my poor wife. The first time I was with her when she was giving birth to Lindsay. I learned a lesson. The second time I took my wedding ring off. Put it in my pocket when Alicia came. Because my wife was squeezing my hand and blood was coming out of my hand. So I took my ring off. I learned that lesson. But she had a hard time. So under the woman... He said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. And sorrow shalt thou bring forth children. Thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. See, I'm saying, I'm telling you, God designed it this way. He, he's very wise, too. God is very wise. You've got to trust him. And unto Adam, he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. Thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art and unto dust shalt thou return. This is absolutely 100% dead on true. Every farmer and every gardener who plants anything knows it is a constant battle keeping weeds and thistles and stuff that you don't want out of your garden. Farmers spend thousands of dollars every year on herbicides, pesticides, you name it. Just that little flower garden that I have irritates me to death. I keep pulling these little thistles out of it. And once I get them all pulled out two weeks later, there's more of them growing up different places. And I'm going, where were you two weeks ago? I don't know what their deal is. I think they just wait on me to pull up their friends and then they show up again. But see, that's us that's our life there's always thistles and thorns that we've got to pull out and get rid of always and they'll show up they'll keep showing up too 
So that was the curse to the woman. Uh, verse 17, and add unto Adam, or, or, that was the curse to, to the man. Now in verse 20, and Adam um, called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. So w- watch this now. Even though there was an earthly consequence to their sin, God still covered them Himself in righteousness so that when they died, they would live forever with Him. Even though Adam and Eve were free, they confessed their sins. God forgave them, but I could go around this room and ask every one of you, do you believe that you have suffered earthly consequences for sins that you know God has forgiven you of? Raise your hand. Of course. Of course. Things that we do have consequences. God does forgive them. And in God's, and when you compare eternity in heaven to the consequences that you endure down here, listen, you've, you've, you've got it way better going for you when you get to heaven than this little thing that we endure down here. I, I don't know how to say this any better, but what I'm saying is heaven's going to be worth all that we have to suffer down here for. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, don't focus on why this is happening, why this is happening, why you're having a bad this or what, you know, why you're having a rough time here. Don't focus on that. Focus on heaven. Christ looked beyond the cross to the glory that was on the other side of the cross and that compelled him to go to the cross. I'll go to the cross. I'll endure it. It'll be over with. And then I'll be at the right hand of my father. And, that, and that's where he is right now. I don't know how my life is going to end. I wish I knew, but I, maybe I don't wish I knew. But I don't know how it's going to end. I don't know what heartaches and trials and tribulations I'm going to have between now and then. But I know for a fact that then when I die and leave this world, one day in heaven will be worth all of the sorrows that I suffered down here. But you've got eternity. So God, yes, earthly consequences. Instead of Adam and Eve getting to live in the garden and eating of everything freely, now Adam has to plant and sow. And in planting and sowing, he's got to pull up thorns and thistles. He's going to work his tail off, and the bread that he eats every night at supper time, he's going to have earned it with the sweat of his brow. That's... That's the curse. That's part of it. But I'm telling you, it's worth it. We're going to get heaven. Amen? Now, let's look at the covering very quickly. Because, and unto Adam also unto his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. So, Revelation 19. I'll turn there. Give you a chance. Here we go, Revelation 19, verse 7, says, Let us be glad and rejoice, and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife hath made herself ready. Listen, I, I guarantee you that my wife spent a lot more time getting herself ready for our wedding than I did. I put on my suit, my shoes, my tie, comb my hair. I'm ready! Took me 10 minutes. Took my wife, Gloria, how long did it take? Hours? All day. day. Love you, sweetie pie. But look at, yeah. But look at this. And to her was granted, listen to to verse 8. To her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen. Clean and white. So let me ask you a question. What does white represent in the wedding? Huh? Purity. But 
as is very common nowadays, most of those women are probably not pure when they walk that aisle. As is the case with the bride of Jesus Christ. But he has made her pure. Do you understand that? Jesus purified his bride. And it was granted to her that she should be arrayed in this. And look at what it says. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Now, some of you know where I'm already going to go with this. Because, Ron, in the modern translations, all of them change verse 8 to make it say, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. In other words, your self-righteousness gives you access to be the bride of Christ in heaven. And that's not true. That's not what that says. The fine linen is the righteousness of saints that she has been granted to wear. God has given her the right to be arrayed in virtue, in white and righteousness, by the righteousness of His Son, Jesus Christ. Even though... Everybody that constitutes the body of Christ is a sinner. And yet, we all are come together to be the body of Jesus Christ. And he has adorned us with his righteousness. And now we're pure. Remember what we said about how we can eat pork now. Because in the Old Testament, pork is not kosher. Okay, you're not to eat pigs, you're not to eat bacon and ham and, you know, pork tenderloin and all that stuff. You're not to eat that stuff. That's unclean. So what does the New Testament say about that? If it's received with thanksgiving and prayer, it's sanctified. So instead of us violating the law by eating the pig, God purifies the pig so we can eat it. And if God purifies it, it's pure. Look at Isaiah 61, 10. Turn there. Well, I almost got it. I almost landed right on it. Isaiah 61, 10. Look at this. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. Look at that. He clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a, as a bridegroom decked himself with ornaments and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. That is exactly what Revelation 19 was referring to. Was Isaiah 61.10. He hath clothed me with garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. Now I'm going to for those who may not have heard this, I'm going to throw in my theory again on when a child is ready to be saved. Because we know from two witnesses in the Bible that children who do not know the difference between good and evil, their sins are not held against them. When God judged Israel in numbers because of the 12 spies and the 10 came back saying we can't go into Canaan land. So God said, everybody who's come out of Egypt, you're going to perish in the wilderness with the exception of the little ones who do not know the difference between good and evil. So God allowed the little ones to go into the promised land safe. We know that David's son with Bathsheba, when that child died, David said, I, he will not come to me, but I will go to him. 
So we know that. We know Jesus said, you know, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not for such is the kingdom of heaven. So I believe that children below a certain age are safe from hell. They do not go to hell. But there's a point in a child's life where they start understanding the difference between good and evil. Right? When is that age? I think that it's related to the time in which they realize they're naked. Little kids, little ones, run around naked and think nothing of it. Right? Think nothing of it. They run around naked. They don't have any idea whatsoever that they're naked. But then they get to an age to where automatically, before they come out of the bathroom, before they come out of the bathtub, before they come out of their bedroom, they put clothes on. I think at that time, when they're aware of their own nakedness, they are aware of the difference between good and evil. Does that make sense to everybody? Because you, when you look at it, that was the first thing that hit Adam and Eve in their mind was, we're naked. So I think when children get to the age that they understand the difference between naked and not naked, and they put and they clothe themselves before they come out. They they're not going to run around naked like they did when they was two years old. I think about that time they're starting to understand good and evil. And it's about that time you should have already started to teach them the ways of God and salvation. Does that make sense to everybody? That's that's my theory. Because uh, turn to Second um, Corinthians five. And I'll show you this. I, when I die and I go stand before God, I don't desire to remain naked for eternity. I desire to be clothed upon. Okay? And that's in your Bible, 2 Corinthians 5. Uh, verse 1, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring, look at the language here now, to be closed upon with our house which is from heaven. And isn't that what we want? I mean, I, I in my life have suffered great pain. I know what pain is like. My wife is my hero. In the last year, she has suffered so much. And my desire is that one of these days, I'm going to get a body that won't hurt anymore. I'm going to get a body that's built by God himself. And doesn't suffer pain, doesn't suffer sorrow, doesn't sin, doesn't lust, doesn't, doesn't have pride, doesn't do anything wrong. That's the body that I want. So, verse 2, for in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. Verse 3, if so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed. But clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. So my desire is that I am clothed by Christ himself and remain that way for all of eternity covered in the robe of Christ's righteousness. Not to be running around naked in heaven for all of eternity. You remember the hippies? The streakers? 
Remember those days when guys would go running through town or jump out on the baseball field and run around naked? Or when communes, the hippies started having communes out in California and other places, in Oregon, Washington, and they would say clothing is optional, we're going to be free. They're not free. They're in bondage to sin. And when you can walk around in front of people naked, your conscience has been seared with a hot iron. You have no guilt over that. You're a reprobate as far as, as, far as the Bible's concerned. So, Revelation 3, He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Revelation 3, 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eyes said, that thou mayest see. See, the, the Laodicean church thought that they were well, righteous, wealthy, but God said, you're poor and wretched and miserable and blind and naked. And he said, I see right through you. I know your guilt. I know your sin. So I'm asking you. I'm encouraging you. I'm pleading with you. Buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich, which is the Bible. And then uh, ask me to, be, to clothe you, to cover up your nakedness, because you are naked. There's... There's even churches in America that have advertised sermon series called The Naked Church. That just don't sound right to me. My desire is not that I can get to a place where I can be unclothed and be fine with it. My desire is to get to the place where I can be clothed with God's holiness for all of eternity because I don't like this body. I don't like this body. I don't like what it goes through. I don't like what it, the misery that it, that it suffers. I don't like anything about it. And I want a new one. God granted that to Adam and Eve because they confessed their sins. Be honest. Be honest, everybody, everybody online, be honest about your sins before God. I'm not saying you got to tell them to everybody in the world. I'm telling you to be honest to God about your sins. And I promise you, he will cover you and he will clothe you in his righteousness. And when he sees you, he will not see your sin. Isn't that great? Amen. Uh, one more revelation 19 11. I saw heaven open behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he doth judge and make war his eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself and he was clothed. Look at Jesus as clothed clothed with the vesture dipped in blood, but it was white because the white blood cells. And his name is called the word of God. Look at this. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. That's us. We got married to Jesus and he's going to have us as his bride help him fight the battle. Come on, wife. Let's go stomp the Antichrist. And we're going, yeah, let's go. And we're clothed in white linen. White and clean, made white by Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for clothing us. God, help, help us to be honest. God, you forced us. You forced us at a time in our life. You confronted us with our sins. Just like you did Adam and Eve. And you forced us to confess to you. And we did. And God, you pleaded with us to tell the truth. And we told the truth. And the truth made us free. Father, help people to realize that the church doesn't want to hurt anybody. It's not out to get anybody. It's not out to condemn anybody. Father, help 
people around the world that may be listening to this, that your people just want other people to be made free like you made us free. Thank you, Father, for teaching us some good things tonight. We love you. Thank you for the lessons. Help us, Father, throughout this week. Give us bread. Keep us safe on our journeys. We pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.